So one important spindle cell lesion that I want you all to know as head and neck pathologists is DFSP. And that's because DFSP is classically taught as a multinodular fungating mass on the trunk of young adults. And that surely is the classic example. But I, I worked with a, a DFSP patient support groups on Facebook. I volunteered there for about oh, seven years or maybe, maybe even longer now, about seven years or so. And um, so I've met a lot of patients and many of them we found uh, had examples that did not fit this classic morphology. They can occasionally occur on the extremities. And I would say on a relatively common basis, they occur on the scalp, particularly the head and neck, especially the scalp. So it's a really important thing for people doing uh, any pathology in the head and neck to know about DFSP and to know that the scalp is a, a relatively common site for DFSP. I've seen many, many examples on the scalp. And the other thing is that, yes, if you let them grow for years, they will become multinodular and fungating. But when they start out, they often have a very benign, non-specific appearance clinically. And I cannot tell you how many hundreds of people I've met and cases I've seen in real life where they were clinically thought to be a cyst or a scar or a lipoma or a keloid or a dermatofibroma. And those things often result in delay in diagnosis and delay in biopsying uh, the lesions. So it's a very, very common finding where they'll think it's a cyst and the surgeon will go to shell it out and their post-op diagnosis is uh, not a cyst because it clearly wasn't cystic once they cut into the lesion. Um, okay. And so we'll show these in a minute, but they're bland spindle cells, often with a story form pattern. So despite the fact that it's a sarcoma, you do not, you almost never see pleomorphism of any significant amount in, in DFSP. And that's because it's a translocation sarcoma. Most translocation associated spindle cell tumors have uniform monotonous nuclei and lack pleomorphism. There are, of course, always exceptions to the rule, but I think that that's a really important take-home pearl uh, that I learned from one of my mentors, Dr. Mark Edgar. And so the translocation most commonly seen is collagen 1A1 PDGF beta, um, and you can test for that by FISH. Uh, or RT-PCR if needed, but new, uh, new um, uncommon variant involving PDGFD and a couple of different partner genes um, has been described. So I, um, I like to, if I do, if I'm worried about DFSP and it's not a straightforward case, I usually will go to FISH. And if this FISH is negative, then I like to go on to PDGFD as a follow-up reflex FISH. In straightforward cases, molecular, in my opinion, is not needed, but I do it on cases where I'm either pretty sure it's DFSP, but I'm not certain, and they're going to go do a big surgery, or much more often where I'm pretty sure something's not DFSP, but it's a bland CD34 spindle cell thing, and I'm not able to classify it otherwise, and those are the cases where I do the fish just to be sure I'm not missing something like a DFSP. All right, so the story form pattern, this beautiful swirly-whirly growth, um, uh, it's very, very visually appealing to look at. You can describe it with 100 words, but really you got to just see it. A lot of DFSP have that, but I've seen DFSPs that didn't have story form, and I've seen other things like dermatofibromas and a variety of others that do have story form patterns. So that alone is not enough. All right, what we really want to see with DFSP is this, those bland, swirly-whirly spindle cells infiltrating and entrapping adipose tissue with this so-called honeycomb pattern. You'll see islands of fat trapped in the midst of the tumor. This all used to be subcutis and the tumor has completely replaced most of it and just left these little stranded islands of fat wrapped around by tumor very tightly, right? And this is the, the you know, kind of almost Swiss cheese or honeycomb pattern, very characteristic. So it can run a range, but I think it's important to know that sometimes the subcutis gets overrun by tumor and all you'll see is a tiny little bit and the rest of the tumor will look like solid story form bland spindle cells. So I remember when I first saw that in fellowship, I was very confused because I thought this doesn't look infiltrative. It looks smooth bordered. And Dr. Weiss told me it's because the tumor's grown all the way to the edge and it's replaced all the fat and only a tiny little bit of fat trapping is seen. So that's a really important thing to know about. And I particularly feel like I see that scenario where there's very little fat trapping because the tumor has grown over all the subcutis. I see that most often, I think, in the scalp where the tumor kind of grows down to the galea or the periosteum and then kind of hits a wall there and spreads out. And in, and in the middle, all the fat gets replaced except for just a tiny bit. So really important to know about that. CD34 is a very sensitive stain that's going to be positive in the vast majority of conventional DFSPs. Um, uh, but is not, of course, specific at all. It stains lots of different um, uh, fibroblastic and uh, myofibroblastic types of, or excuse me, fibroblastic entities, and also can stain things, you know, like spindle cell lipoma, uh, which can sometimes have overlap morphologically with DFSP. So 
very helpful as a screening tool, but make sure that you don't let CD34 lead you astray. It stains many different things, sensitive but not specific. Now here's an example where you can see the conventional DFSP over here, but then an abrupt transition to a very cellular nodule. And going closer, that cellular nodule has, has still doesn't have pleomorphism, but it's much larger cells. They're much more tightly packed together. There's more mitotic activity. And they're arranged in these kind of sharply intersecting, acute angle intersecting herringbone pattern fascicles. Um, so this is an example of fibrosarcomatous transformation in a DFSP. And these, in some studies, have shown that these do have a somewhat higher rate of, of aggressive behavior like metastases. Um, uh, but the treatment is basically, as far as I understand it, most people agree that the treatment is pretty much the same. You excise these tumors either with wide local excision or Mohs surgery to achieve widely negative margins. So that's the, the goal of treatment, and uh, in select cases, other modalities can be applied as well, but usually uh, complete excision with negative margins is the mainstay of treatment. And I've, I think I've only seen, I've seen, I think, well over 100 DFSPs now, and I, in my own personal practice, I believe I've only seen one or two uh, metastatic DFSPs. So, but it does, it does happen sometimes, but local recurrence is a much bigger issue usually. All right, now I'm going to just briefly touch on this. Dermatofibromas are also known as benign fibrocysteocytoma. They most often occur on the extremities or sometimes the trunk. Uh, but I think it's important to note that they can sometimes occur on the head and neck. And when they do, they tend to look different than the classic conventional dermatofibromas. They tend to be a bit bigger and they are more cellular and they're often kind of a, a nodule in the deep dermis or subcutis. So I, I've often seen these where clinically they look like a cyst and something nondescript because because they're deeper down, they don't have, have much change of the epidermis over it. So they, they'll look like a cyst or some other lesion. And then once they're excised, we see that it's a cellular dermatofibroma. And I tend to see these most often in kids and young adults. So it's an important thing to know that dermatofibromas, although uncommon, definitely can occur on the head and neck. And they sometimes look a bit different than the ones uh, elsewhere in the body. The things that can help you in sorting out dermatofibroma from DFSP is number one, there tends to be a bit more um, cellular variation in the size and shape. The cells are more plump and they often have a bit of atypia and even can have scattered obvious pleomorphism or so-called monster cells. Mitosis scattered in the midst of a DF is a very common finding. And the other thing is you'll often find a little bit of hemosiderin. You'll find some multinucleated histiocytes. You can find some foamy cells. Sometimes you find little blood-filled spaces or hemorrhage. All of those features are very helpful in pointing towards dermatofibroma and away from DFSP. And I have uh, some various videos on dermatofibroma and DFSP on my YouTube channel or on, on that directory on Kiko that I showed the link for at the beginning of the talk. So you can go check those out if you want to brush up um, on that a little bit more. And sometimes DFs can extend down into the subcutis and sometimes they can even be totally centered in the subcutis. So when they do that, they tend to send little fingers out into the fat and that can get people really concerned uh, to think it might be DFSP. One thing is that you often will find some fat necrosis around these little areas, whereas in dermatofibrous sarcoma pertubrians, you tend to not really see that. The fat seems to be kind of entrapped, but otherwise more or less normal. Uh, whereas here, the fat begins to break down and get a little bit of fat necrosis and kind of some inflammatory response. Um, that's kind of a subtlety, but I do find that helpful. Um, and that was described in a paper uh, about a year or so ago uh, by the group at uh, University of Michigan, I believe. Very helpful uh, feature. And cellular DFs can have that kind of herringbone fascicle pattern that can make you think of DFSP. So it's important to know, and, in, and again, if there's any doubt, um, to me, if I see this, if I can find other areas that look more classic for DF, that's helpful. But if I have a doubt, I can do immunostain for CD34, or I can do molecular um, if needed, okay? And sometimes cellular DFs can even have a little bit of necrosis, and that can be a little scary. Now, CD34 in dermatofibromas, particularly the, the bigger cellular ones, really important to know that there's often a rich vascular network, and those are going to stain with CD34, but the tumor cells are going to be negative, except at the very periphery, the normal dermis has a lot of CD34 expression because of dendritic cells that live there, and those get kind of pushed out of the way as a dermatofibroma grows, but what happens is they pile up and they kind of make this thick rim of CD34 expression at the periphery of the dermatofibroma. So I like to call this the CD34 positive halo, because if you can see the whole lesion from low power, it'll look like a halo or ring of more bright staining at the edge of the DF, 
Um, and then the middle of the DF is going to be totally negative except for the background vessels. So just be aware of that. If you see some bright staining, go look at the middle of the dermatofibroma and it should be dead negative. It would be very unusual to see areas like this in a DFSP. With the one exception I forgot to mention that the fibrous sarcomatous DFSPs sometimes do have loss of CD34 expression. So that can be a challenge in those cases.